Blog Talk Radio. Hi, well, welcome to Mind Shifter Radio with Dr. Michael Rice, the Forgiveness Doctor. We're here every Monday through Friday from 2 to 3 Eastern Standard Time. And we want to thank Carol. She's on the other end there helping us out, and we really appreciate her. The call in number is 646 200 4169. And hello, Michael. So, Carol, how are things on the switchboard? Are we seeing anybody who's got any questions yet? Or Not yet. The um, there, is pe- there is people there. They're coming in, uh, but I will let you know uh, as soon as we get someone. Awesome. Well, for those who are just joining us, uh, we're, uh, we've been in Fort Lauderdale for about six weeks. We weren't uh, supposed to be in Florida this year. Um, and we got a call from one of the places we were scheduled to speak next year and the uh, the call was asking when we were going to show up and we said well in January 2012 like we planned yeah. and they said well we've got you on the schedule for 2011 can you get down here and we were supposed to be going back to Hartley to Missouri and uh, so we had a tough decision to make it was going to be January in Fort Lauderdale or in Missouri and we made the tough decision and so here we are and uh, we did the one week of workshops, and it just turned out that uh, things started to pop. So we went from week to week to week to week the last six weeks. We've done a workshop series every week. And uh, it, it just has been nonstop. So we decided to stop for a little bit and look for a last-minute cruise and got one of those great deals on a last-minute cruise. So we're actually sitting on a Holland America cruise line ship called the Rotterdam, and getting ready to uh, cruise to the Bahamas and point south. So we're going to suffer through that, and we'll take you guys with us in our hearts. And in the meantime, uh, David will be, uh, uh, and Terry will be doing the show next week, except for Tuesday, when we'll be doing WWNN 1470 AM in South Florida, 50,000 watt station that goes from uh, Port St. Lucie all the way down into Miami, and uh, we've actually pre-recorded that show, and the title of that show is going to be Still Waiting for Your Ship to Come In, Which One Did You Send Out? Well, we're going out on one, and actually it's that's a presentation I haven't listened to in a while, and Jeannie edited it last night, so Jeannie, tell us a little bit about Give us a preview of the show for, uh, for uh, Tuesday. Okay. Well, in editing it, of course, I had to go through, and, and uh, it was a long process, taking out all the little glitches, and that was my first shot on at doing that. So. Anyway, uh, it was all about abundance, and that whatever you're sending out is what's back in. And excuse you said excuse that, me, Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie, there's a, there's a lot of feedback coming from your line. Okay. Okay. Is, is this any better? No? Okay. Uh, it sounds like it's better right there, so let's try that. Okay. Um, so I was editing the the show last night, and it's about whatever you send out is what comes back in. And if you send out that there's never enough, and whether it's and not just financial, whether it's, you know, there's never enough help, there's never enough love, there's never enough money, there's never enough time, whatever you're sending out like that, then that's what you get back. And if you send out that there's an abundance of everything, whether it's time, love, money, then that's what you get back. And so it's all about consciousness and creating consciously and looking at, you know, your life. And if if what you're getting is not what you want, then you need to look at what's underneath and what you're really sending out and make a change there. And that's tied in with, with forgiveness. And so it's it's a really good show. You sound like Ed Sullivan, Jeannie. A really good show. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It's been a while since I've thought of Ed Sullivan. Anyway, we had an absolute blast on Wednesday night. There's a a, uh, rabbi that we were introduced to about two weeks ago. And in being introduced to him, uh, he invited us to come and speak for their center. And so we spoke about forgiveness 
on Tuesday night at a place called the TAO Center, the Posnick Community Center. And it was interesting. Uh, okay, I think we just lost Michael. Jeannie, are you still with me? I am. Okay, good night. Well. Um, yeah, I just lost Michael, so he needs to call back in. Uh, call back so, um, yeah, so okay. someone, someone in the chat room wrote, uh, I need to do a worksheet on jealousy. And I think, you know, you can get a worksheet on uh, at whyagain.com, but I think this is because you guys are on a cruise and we're sit, we're all sitting here. So I'll bring Michael back and see him on uh, Okay, so you did the worksheet, and the object of attention is Jeannie and Michael. And what happened is because we're on a cruise and you're still there working, and so what does it make you feel? You're jealous. And what's the thought behind the feeling? So let's just walk through that and work it out. <laughs> well, the, the thought behind their feeling was they were laughing. So, <laughs> so we do have Michael back on the switchboard, so he is here with us again. Michael, are you there? I sure am. Isn't it interesting how just about anything can give us an opportunity to learn forgiveness? It's such an awesome way this game of life is set up. It is so awesome. But I started to share before we were disconnected that uh, we were actually presenting on Wednesday night a forgiveness process in the uh, Holocaust Museum at Kosnick Center. And it was really awesome. We had a really wonderful, really, really sweet, welcoming, willing, open group of folks and presented the idea of human life being made up of that thing we call love and that our work is to reclaim our human lives. And it was a fun presentation. There was some deep uh, deep process work that happened. Uh, I was reminded, as I was talking to someone about it this morning, of the original meaning of the word liturgy. In fact, we might have talked about that yesterday, and that liturgy means our common work. And so uh, we addressed some of the Holocaust issues and... Uh, I believe a huge opening for some real healing happened there. And um, the the evening ended up in great delight and great joy and uh, was a really wonderful experience. So thanks to, to everyone who uh, who welcomed us on Wednesday night to the uh, TAO Center for Jewish Renewal. It was absolutely awesome. Well, actually, Kim told that last week, so, yeah. So that was uh, an exciting opportunity, and uh, we are uh, opening many other doors. We're actually getting ready to head to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. When we finish here in Florida, March 25th, we're going to be working with youth. We're going to be working in the prison system. We're going to be working in a, I don't know, we're, we, we had some conversation. We may be working in a brothel, doing some forgiveness there, and uh, uh, the city of Pahrump, and we've got someone who's working in the uh, VA system, a physician who's writing, and we acknowledge Dr. Androcki is writing prescriptions for people to do forgiveness. That uh, There's some real healing work that needs to be done. And so he, we, the thing we did, the, the workshop we did the night before we left Las Vegas about eight weeks ago was with a group of 20 Spanish-speaking medical assistants in his offices and trained them to do the worksheet to support people in the process of forgiveness because, of course, when you think of thought, you know, you go back into the original Aramaic language and the opening words in the book of John were told, say, in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh. But actually in Aramaic what it says is in the beginning was the mind energy and the mind energy became flesh. And when you recognize that, it's a fact of physiology that when you think of thought and you check out Bruce Lipton's work, or you can order a DVD from our website called uh, Mind Body Bioenergetics. It's a one-hour television interview with myself and a one-hour television interview with Bruce Lipton. And what Bruce is showing is that in the laboratory, when you think of thought, you produce a molecule in your structure, and the molecule is called a neuropeptide. That neuropeptide circulates around in your structure until it um, lands on a receptor site that matches it. And at that point, the cell replicates the neuropeptide chemically. 
And when our culture feeds us, feeds us thoughts of fear, of sadness, of grief, of pain, uh, the wake-up call is to recognize that that's all got to be removed. Elsewise, we live out of it, we act out of it, we behave out of it. And when we behave out of hate and fear and pain, uh, we don't behave very well toward ourselves, toward our families, toward our neighbors. And so there's, you know, the, the continuation of this understanding that human life is about the active presence of love. The, the workshop on Thursday night I actually started out with a, what I consider to be an awesome quote from a rabbi named Helil. And uh, he, he says this, and this is out of the Torah, he says, that which you consider negative when done to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the sum and substance of the law. The rest is commentary. Now go and learn this. And uh, so he's, you know, kind of shaking a finger at us humans, but it's time for us to reclaim our human lives. And uh, it's it's uh, an awesome work to be able to look at someone who, you know, it's, it's not unusual for Jeannie and I to see somebody on the verge of suicide. In fact, probably one of the most dramatic workshop series we did uh, all two years ago, maybe three years ago now, we were in Hawaii, and we did a series at a, a church there in Diamond Head, the Unity Church, and we were still in town six weeks later. We actually, This was another difficult situation. We had to actually extend our stay in Hawaii in February by a couple of weeks. That was tough, but we did it. Anyway, uh, we were invited to go back to that church, and we did another series. We had three people who came to us in that second series that shared with us that the week that they showed up at our workshops on the 1st of January, that they had planned on committing suicide. And six weeks later, having done the worksheet process and doing the work, were excited and delighted about being alive, excited about their lives, instead of being in trauma. And when you recognize that trauma is not the truth about life, it may be the truth about our experience at any given point, but feelings are actually a reflection of the content of our minds. They are not a reflection of circumstances happening in our lives. Feelings are a reflection of content in our minds not circumstances. However, if we hook our feelings up to circumstances, we give away our power, we dissociate from those feelings, and we make them impossible to remove. Forgiveness is the way you remove those feelings. Forgiveness is the way that you come in touch with your own dissociated mind. And once you do, you get to confront those things directly rather than indirectly, which is what empowers you to change them. And so we're here to share that forgiveness technology with every mind, heart, and being on the planet. And Carol, as the host of our host of our radio show through Blog Talk and the Angel Network, we are appreciative of the opportunity that we get to create support. You know, one of the, the difficulties, one of the shortcomings in our work in the past has been we travel to so many cities, and when we finish, if the support group doesn't get started and work effectively, then you know, there's no support for people who've learned the tools, and it makes it difficult to continue. And so we're just so blessed that now we have this uh, blog talk radio show that five days a week, anybody in the world, it doesn't matter if we've been in Russia or if we've been in Greece or if we've been in Africa, wherever it is, Sweden, that people can tap in and listen, ask questions, and get uh, refinement on the use of the tools and support in using the tools. And Jeannie and I have a commitment, and our commitment is to be on the support team of every mind, heart, and being on the planet. So thank you, for Carol, for assisting us in uh, uh, facilitating that. And, of course, Carol has a radio show that happens. What is the new schedule for your radio show now, Carol? I'm doing um, Mondays and Fridays at 9 a.m., um, which has been really – actually, I've been really surprised because uh, I was figuring 9 a.m. might be a little early for the people on the West Coast and stuff, but, you know, I've got – 
great feedback. Someone from Singapore, uh, she was she sent me a message and said, thank you so much for changing your time because now they're able to listen. I have a guest coming on from the UK, and before when I used to do the show, she it would be late in the night with for her, and she uh, said I can't do nights anymore. And I said, well, I changed it to morning, so now you can. So it's working out really great. Oh, cool. So that means I need to change the time of my show. Okay, we'll have to look into that. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> You just did. <laughs> or you said. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, with the uh, the kind of schedule that we keep, um, this two to three time o'clock time slot is perfect for us. So, so oh, do we have any, uh, anything uh, happening in the chat well, room? Well, somebody in the chat room or? wants to would like you to uh, talk a little bit about your workshops that you're going to be doing in Heartland this summer. That's one oh, of the okay, questions sure. here. And, and if anybody else okay. has questions, you can type it in the chat room, and I will be able to give it. I'll give those to Michael, or you can call in at six four six two zero zero four one six nine. Cool. So Heartland is the teaching center we have in the Ozarks in southern Missouri. We're about an hour due east of Branson. Pretty wintry there right now, but uh, spring and fall, summer are awesome there, and we've got what used to be a resort that we converted to the teaching center. We've got uh, 15 buildings and 67 acres. And we do an intensive season that starts, this year will start on July the 8th. We'll be doing, starting a 65-day intensive. And so there will be people that are there for the whole 65 days. We've actually got some folks coming in from England. A couple with two children are coming in to do three months with us this summer. That's going to be awesome. And uh, they're going to be working with uh, their their skill is in the area of community building. So they're going to be working in the arena of community building along with studying our work to uh, take some of the tools back to their community building uh, uh, workshops. And uh, so we'll start on July the the 8th with a nine-day codependence to interdependence segment. So there'll be some people who'll be there maybe just for that nine days. And then uh, we'll move from that to a nine-day Why Is This Happening to Me Again segment. And then Why Is This Happening to Me Again, we cover several workshops, Why Is This Happening to Me Again, Healing Through Relationships, Communication, Did You Hear What I Think I Said, Purpose, Personal Power, Commitment, Empowered to Heal, Mind Shifter, Still Point Breathing, and Hands-On Energy Field Work. So that will be what that nine days will look like. And then there will be another nine days connected to that one that will be teacher training for people who either want to deepen their experience and understanding of the forgiveness process and the why is this happening to me again principles. That second nine days will be for those folks and also for people who want to teach it. So we get a, a two different types of groups for that uh, teacher training. Go ahead, Carol. We have a caller um, here on the chat, uh, cha- uh, the switchboard. Would you like to go ahead and take it? Sure, let's go for it. Okay. We have area code 815. What is your name and where are you calling from? This is Tim Hayes. Hey there, Tim Hayes. And I'm calling in from um, about an hour and a half northwest of Chicago, and I'm just calling to um, say that, you know, it's easier if somebody else is tooting your horn for you. So um, my experience... (laughs) after 35 years of traveling around as a psychologist and taking all of these trainings and spiritual growth things. And my time at Heartland was by far the most powerful and effective for my personal growth and rejuvenation that I've run into in the past 30-plus years of doing this kind of work. So it's a very wow. loving environment. It's a very, a very solid set of tools, but... The thing that you can't get that even goes beyond the tools is the quality of the people in that facility and their dedication to work on their own stuff while supporting you to work on your stuff. It's just phenomenal. Well, I I couldn't ask for a much better testimony than that, Tim. We'll have to get you to put that one on video. That would be awesome to be able to put it on our website. Thank you for that input. And uh, and I want to acknowledge you for the... uh, the way for five years you've uh, taken the tools and worked with people there in the Chicago area as a support group leader, and it's uh, it's really awesome to see and hear from people who are getting those results. Jeannie's got a thought, too. I just wanted to thank you because the last time that you were at Heartland, um, you also processed me, and so it, it's uh, 
reciprocal there. And so we really appreciate you and what you have to offer. Well, thank you. It's it's, uh, it's great the way it feeds in a loop and everybody benefits when we all do our own stuff. So I'm I'm very grateful. I was talking to, to uh, David earlier. He said he would be available on this uh, call today, um, and and maybe a little bit later on we'll get into discussing what's going to happen next week. But I just wanted to give you that input. So. I'll just listen while you go on. If there are any other questions, are we there? Okay. Yes, I'm here. There, Michael, are you still there? Yes, I'm here, and I was just going to say that uh, anybody who wants to connect with Dr. Tim, you can go to our website under the support group section and uh, get the location and times and all that for the uh, the support group that Dr. Tim runs. If you're up in that area, that would be. Uh, you, you'd be very well taken care of and supported to uh, to join in that in that group. And thank you for that acknowledgement. That's uh, that's pretty awesome. That's, and that's you know that's exactly what we're about doing. That's what we want to do is to create that level and that quality of support. And um, I'm I'm an eternal student of this work. Uh, I don't pretend to be complete with my process, and uh, and I appreciate it, Tim, when you jump in and support me and my work and uh, being on my team, and I certainly appreciate getting the opportunity to be on yours and support the kind of breakthroughs that uh, that open energy windows. You know, if you go back and you listen to Yeshua 2,000 years ago, he says, I've opened a door wide which no one can close. And the door he opened was that door to forgiveness. I believe that... Uh, the way he presented it has, in, in my knowledge, was unknown on planet Earth up until the time he arrived. And then just about as soon as he left, it was disappeared again. And we've been taught, and, and I've, I've taught ar- around the world in several different cultures, and it, it seems like it's pretty much universal that the forgiveness that is talked about is how everybody else is the bad guy and did it to me, but I'm going to be big about it and forgive them, which is a Greek idea of pardoning, which is a nice thing to do, but it has nothing to do with forgiveness. And uh, so we're working to reestablish that original Aramaic idea of forgiveness. And when you do, I mean, there's where the credit is really due, is the the power of that tool and the way that it opens the literally the the multi-generational database that we call our body-mind unit and the magnificent healing that takes place. Again, you know, I don't care what the drama and trauma is. It is a frequency in the mind that if you deny it, it's not changeable. When you own it, it's it's a fantasy. It's not real. It's not true. And I can show you circumstance after circumstance after circumstance where people were in, you know, uh, blood feuds and, and you know, I- insane things. And all of a sudden, they wake up and go, oh, my God, this is about something different. <laughs> I, I could have had, had the presence of the human life instead. And uh, and when people realize that, everything starts to shift. And one of the things that I've done a lot of work with over the years is the Course in Miracles. And one of the coolest thoughts, I think, in the Course in Miracles is one that says, problems are meaningless. But don't tell that to somebody who's in the middle one, <laughs> because mm-hmm. we're in that middle thing. Mm-hmm. So, Michael, I have a question that someone uh, yeah. that I've heard several people uh, talk about before. People, I've heard people mention this and stuff. You know, we talk about forgiveness. You know, like most people are like, "Well, I need to forgive that person. I haven't been able to forgive that person." What we have been, you've been teaching, and what's the truth is the the self forgiveness, forgiving yourself, starting with there, all of that within. But what is that with the people that are needing to forgive? a higher power, let's use the word God. People are angry at God for some of the tragedies, some of the things that are happening. How do they go about this? Because I hear a lot of people say, you know, why would God do this? You know, they're angry there. So yep. that's Good. basically Great yourself. Great question. Great question. I, uh, first of all, let me just refine one of the things you said. It isn't about forgiving yourself or self-forgiveness either. 
because then we're back to people letting themselves off the hook. The forgiveness tool is something that you, if you're in rage, if you're in fear, if you're in grief, if you're in pain, then your mind is in error and you apply forgiveness to the rage, the fear, the grief, the pain to remove it from your physiology. So mm-hmm. just to be real clear about forgiveness, it's it's not applied to self, it's not applied to others, it's applied to whatever's going on in your physiology that's unlike a human life. And it mm-hmm. really doesn't matter who the object of attention is, who we're pointing that at. And I remember mm-hmm. years ago we had, a, we had a young man at Heartland who... Uh, was brought up as a Catholic, and at three years of age, his mother had cancer, and they told him if he just prayed hard enough that his mother would be healed. And this man, when I met him, was in his um, late 40s. You want to talk about somebody with a lot of rage toward God, there it was. Now, Mm -hmm. you know, when we pray for somebody's healing, first of all, we're not doing prayer. That's you know, kind of telling God what God should be doing. And there are arenas that aren't our business. In, in fact, um, Larry Dossie has done some research on prayer, or what, what the world calls prayer. And what he came up with, what he found was the most effective healing that was possible in that arena of prayer was non-directed prayer. In other words, you're not telling God what God should do for you. And, of course... If we tell God what God should do and then God doesn't do it because it's not God's arena, of course, we point our anger toward God, but it's the same thing. We have anger, and it's just another variation on the theme to point it toward the creator. You know, when we start Mm -hmm. asking the creator for things that aren't our business, you know, if, if somebody else has decided on whatever level that it's time for them to die and they're deathly ill and we sit around chanting about how God should fix them, you know, it's really not our business. It's not our place. We're, we're not in the right arena. And so to, to recognize that that's not our place, our place, the real meaning of prayer in Aramaic is to set a trap for God, that you become the space in which love shows up in the world. And when love shows up, things move to the next higher level. They may not look like our human minds think they should look, but they always, always, always move to the next level. And so you apply forgiveness in the same way, uh, whether it's it's the creator or not, that if, let's say in that young man's case, it, he did, would do a worksheet with God as the object of attention. What's the situation? I prayed for my mother to be healed and she died. And what's what are his feelings? His feelings are pain and rage. What's his thought? God should have listened to him. God, they, they lied to me. That was, that was another big one, the church. You know, they, they told him, a three-year-old kid, you pray hard enough. And so, you know, now what, where does that leave him when he's been told by an authority if he prays hard enough, his mother will be healed and his mother dies? Obviously, he didn't pray hard enough. So now he's got a reality in his mind that I'm not good enough. It's my fault that my mother right. died. So, so mm-hmm. he would apply forgiveness to his rage toward God. He would apply forgiveness to his feelings of inadequacy for himself. He would apply, apply forgiveness to his reality that he holds, that he's not uh, not good enough, that he's a failure. They'd all be areas where forgiveness would be applied. And each worksheet would produce a different result in collapsing the ability of physiology to produce any kind of hostility or fear. And that's the idea of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So that's a great question because it's a it's a big one. And, you know, there's so many uh, false uh, expectations that we've placed on the creator that uh, mm-hmm. were made Broken up by promises. humans. Yeah, made up by humans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So unless there are any other questions in the chat room, let's let's go on to talk a little bit more about uh, what happens in the intensives this summer. Let's give out the website so people can go and they can get the workshops and find out your schedule again, too. At uh, sure. uh, whyagain.com. Go to whyagain.com, and you can uh, get, the, get the worksheets and uh, find out the schedule and all the magnificent things that uh, Michael and Jeannie are doing. Yeah, the the website, www.whyagain.com, you can download the book for free in English, German, Russian, Spanish, Farsi, several other languages underway. You can uh, pick up the commitment. You can pick up any of the worksheets. They're all there. And, of course, the schedule. 
and I think we got as far as talking about teacher training uh, next summer, which will be the third nine-day segment that we do. And the teacher training is actually a whole, it's a 17-day workshop. It includes the nine-day, why is this happening to me again, the nine-day um, teacher's training, and they overlap. So there'll be some people who will be there just for the nine-day, why is this happening to me again, and others who may stay for the whole 17, or somebody who might have done the nine-day, why last year and come back and do teacher training this year. That's our, that'll, so that'll be our third segment. And then from there, we'll move into Laws of Living, which is a 16-day workshop. And Laws of Living is the course that we originally uh, developed for the prison system. And when we put it in the prison systems, we cut recidivism by 90% until the sheriff had it thrown out because there was no business left. He basically, his jail was empty. And how do you run a jail if you got no money? How do you pay for your cars and keep a staff? So they threw it out. Uh, don't expect criminal justice to uh, work to get rid of criminality anytime soon uh, because, unfortunately, the incentive is, is in the direction of let's keep those places full. In fact, investment houses, uh, when the federal prison population dropped the investment houses, talked about how bad the news was for investors that uh, prison population was dropping. And uh, you want to talk about insane reverse motivation and a culture based in hostility and fear, that's it. Uh, that, that people actually live in a world where I want to make money because people are in suffering and pain and trauma. It's, it's uh, pretty bizarre to think that human life is capable of that. So anyway, Laws of Living will be a 60-day segment. And then uh, I believe the next one is Course in Miracles. We've got two other segments. It'll be a nine-day uh, Course in Miracles. And uh, we'll focus totally on the why is this happening to me again, forgiveness process, and Course in Miracles for that nine days. And then I believe it's the final one, or I may have these reversed. I have a schedule in front of me. We'll do a uh, nine-day intuitive development. In the intuitive development, uh, we see that as one of the five smooth stones, one of those five faculties of our spiritual beingness. And so we'll spend nine days in doing practical, practical exercises on developing the intuitive faculty, which is the ability to make contact with information without reference to the mind. And so that will make our 65-day intensive. And uh, basically, this, the Heartland is uh, $175 a day, and that includes food, accommodations, workshop, workshop materials, everything totally included. All you have to bring your toothbrush and your blankie, and, uh, and you're pretty well set up for, uh, for summer at Heartland. And, of course, there will be people who will be there for one module or two or three or four. Some will be there for the whole 65. As I say, there's a young family uh, the children are 11 and 5 that are flying over from England, and they're going to be there through the whole intensive 65 days, and, uh, actually a little before and a little after. So we're looking forward to that. It'll be pretty exciting. And, um, what a day. and uh, basically what we do in, in the intensives is we break the day into three parts, morning, afternoon, and evening session. And most days we take the mornings off for people who are, you know, nighttime people and, and not don't, don't get up well in the morning. And that gives us a chance to get food prep done. We do a total fresh and raw dietary regimen, awesome, awesome food. Chef Ari is, uh, is an awesome support for our kitchen. And uh, there are, generally speaking, in each intensive, most days there is an afternoon and an evening session. And uh, that's what we'll be doing. Where, where are we getting all these noises? Michael just entered the room. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you! Oh, I was just going to say, oh, okay. <laughs> that's funny. He decided to come and join us, and he's been sleeping, so he's all yawning. And <laughs> so would you like to here. introduce Michael? Would you like to introduce Michael? Yeah, Michael is um, my pug dog. He um, is actually the heart painter's uh, mascot, and uh, we have we do have pictures somewhere of, of you, Michael, and Michael the the pug dog. All right, there you go, there you go. In the heart painter <laughs> studio, a uh, young lady named Evelyn Balin has a an awesome studio in Boca. She actually sponsored a series of workshops that we did, I think, six days there, a couple of weeks ago, and she has this awesome space where. She paints hearts on anything that doesn't move, and I understand a few things that have moved as well. <laughs> One of the cool things He's we, we to get actually his, uh, his his paw prints, yes. Right, yeah. We were up there uh, um, about a week and a half ago for a birthday party, and there were 
couple of teenage girls, and, and one of the things Evelyn has is a paint room where you put on your oldest or your worst or your best, whatever you want to do, and you go in and you just throw paint. You do canvas. You do yourself. You do each other's face. I mean, it was really cute. To, these girls were just having a blast, and what an awesome idea to have this room that you can splash and throw and do anything you want with paint. It was really cool. So uh, nice. check out, if you're in the Boca area, check out the Heart Painter Studio. It's in... Uh, Royal Palm Plaza down on US One it used to be Meisner Center, I think, didn't it? I'm not sure. Any, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it used to be Meisner. Mm-hmm. Michael, uh, I have another question. Um, my angels are kind of um, bringing these questions to me. You know, people are working on the 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 personal part of the forgiveness. You know, a lot, and but what I'm hearing is. Um, if we want to help raise the consciousness of the world, let's let's use the uh, like for the president, for example, or the news, things like this that may people just kind of talk about. They don't realize that it might be something that's inside of them that's irritating them a little bit about these little subjects because they're so used to just kind of having a conversation about them. But if those right. are some of the things that they could use these worksheets and stuff to help change the consciousness of the planet. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, when you, uh, again, the, the the basic idea, which we spoke of earlier, is that if we hook up our feelings to any event, whether it's politics or the situations in the world or war or abuse or whatever, if we hook our feelings to that event, we become a supporter and a participant in that event. We actually add energy to it if we have some form of hostility or fear about it. The forgiveness process is about take any event around which you think you have hostility, and when you get to the truth of it, what you're going to find is you have hostility. It's got nothing to do with the event. Hooking it to the event is just a way to give your power away and disempower your ability to heal, and on an energetic, literal, measurable, energetic level, you become a supporter of that thing which you abhor by simply abhorring it. If you went back 2,000 years ago, that fellow named Yeshua would say, why are you trying to take the speck out of your brother's eye? Well, you have a beam in your own. Like, wake up time, hello. Notice you've been through this one 87 different times with 42 different people. This is about you. So the greatest gift I think that we can give the planet is to do our own work. If I look at a situation and I find myself enraged in it, first of all, I'm not going to be very smart at trying to bring changes to it because a mind with hostility or fear in it is a mind with defiled perception. It, we're just not very bright when we're in hostility or fear. And when we work through the hostility and fear that we think is about the event, we'll find it will heal something in us, and then we can show up at that event as a human being, as the active presence of love. And the the simple presence of active love taken to those situations begins to dissolve the insanity that's going on. It begins to make the change. But when we hook our feelings and we say, I only feel this because of what happened out there, we just shut off our ability to change those feelings and we play the game of projection. It's all somebody else's fault. And that's what's going on with the whole globe. Nobody wants to take responsibility. It's all somebody else's fault. Or the people who say, well, you know, I, I really know I'm responsible, but I've noticed when you get them in the back room, they got a story about somebody. And their story okay. is always about how it's somebody else's fault. So the greatest gift that we can give in raising the consciousness of the planet is to raise ours. When okay. we do that, we're empowered. Now we've got a perceptual mind that can show us how to take the next step with supporting whatever it is that is sane in the world and removing our support from what is not sane. Now, those mm-hmm. who, who run the insane game want you to believe you have no choice but to support the insane game, and that's just not true. You do have a choice. You always have a choice. Sometimes the choice isn't easy, but, you know, when you decide not to go along with the crowd, the crowd may stand there and spit in your face uh, mm-hmm. because you choose to do something different, but that's... You know, we call that the eighth beatitude attitude. <laughs> and if you look at the eighth beatitude, Yeshua says, you know, if you really do this, there are going to be some people that aren't very happy with you. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and that's okay if people aren't happy with you. If you choose to stay connected to a human life, 
they have the problem if they're not happy of being dis- disconnected from their human lives. And by modeling the actual presence of a human life, whatever's going on, you just may be the one that opens the energy window for the person who's getting ready to push the next button uh, to change their mind, to shift it. And, um, you know, it's if you go back into the ancient Aramaic, which is a physics language, they spoke about a little leavening leavens the whole loaf. And, of course, they weren't talking about bread. They were saying that it's only going to take a few actual human lives to show up. An actual human life is one that, no matter what circumstance they're faced with, maintains a condition of love in their minds. That's an actual human life. And there's so few of them on the planet. And, you know, I don't claim to be there all the time personally either. You know, but to me, it's something to strive toward. And as you strive toward it, you see magnificent changes happening around you. And and it's not about figuring it out. You know, one of the things we point out in our uh, codependence to interdependence workshop is that one of the pseudo-solutions of what we call the non-being mind is, if I could just figure this out. Well, you know, I don't care how much time you sit around and figure on it, and I don't care how much time you critically think about it until you come back into relationship with the dissociated mind. That's what's going to run your life. And so the forgiveness process is one that collapses the dissociated mind and puts us back directly in touch with whatever we've dissociated from. And at that point, we can change it, and we're empowered to bring a whole new frequency to whatever event is going on. And when you choose to be that energy, I, I love what, uh, uh, what Gandhi said. He said, be the change you want to see in the world. Don't sit around in your rage telling everybody else they should be peaceful. Be the change you want to see in the world. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, everything starts to shift. You become an agent of change. One of my early mentors said that it will only take eight people eight actual human lives, and the planet would shift. Which is wow. a pretty sad commentary. I guess that's why there's, there's so much shifting going on, because more and more people are starting to wake up. Exactly, exactly, and starting mm-hmm. to function as the love that we were designed to function. And, you know, there are lots of people who argue about, well, what is a human life and all of that. And it's, it's a really easy argument to end. Just hold a newborn child. You'll know what human mm-hmm. life is. And when you give that up, you don't have a human life anymore. Somebody who's given that up doesn't have a human life anymore. And human life is only present in our physiology when we are experiencing that essential nature that is the newborn's nature, that awesome active presence of love. And that's what we're looking and working to restore to planet Earth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as we were talking, you know, some. Th- as far as like let's talk about the news again and stuff uh our current events or or maybe it might be a work situation for people they may not actually feel that they're feeling or acknowledging that they're feeling uh fear or hostility they may just be uh going along with conversation but I, so that i think that is something that maybe they could use these uh these tools uh this uh as well as if they realize that they are just going along with conversations, actually putting the energy toward that situation. You know, one of the things we suggest to people is get up off your ap- apathy. One of the basic messages <laughs> of the culture, and this is this is drives people, we're driven, by the time we're at this stage, we're driven really pretty deeply out of human life and into the ground. And that is that, uh, well, there's nothing you can do. You know, you're just one person. That's just the way it is. You just have to live with it and accept it. Excuse me, that's the biggest lie ever told. You know, mm-hmm. Hitler used to say, mm-hmm. if you made the lie big enough and told it often enough, then uh, then people would believe it. And millions believe, I'm just one person. There's nothing I can do. Excuse me, that's an absolute fraud and a lie. You are one person. Mm-hmm. That means there's something you can do. In fact, I believe it was Margaret Mead that said, the only thing, indeed, that has ever changed the world is this small group of committed people. The mass mind isn't moving in this direction, you know, anytime soon. But when we get enough individuals who do, then the mass mind is going to make a shift. And each one that chooses to make the shift, each one makes a difference. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So when you find yourself in those conversations just because you want to fit in or, to, you know, it happens to be, make that choice to, to, to step out of it. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, 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 this may sound a little uh, far-fetched when I speak about this, 
And it's far-fetched because we can't function out of brain cells we don't have. Again, if you go back to Yeshua, you'll hear him saying that his teaching is only for those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. In other words, and, and I think we can safely assume pretty much everybody had what we call physical eyes and ears. He was saying it was for those who had the content in their minds to see and function through, they would be capable of doing that. Those who don't have that content can't function through it, can't function out of it. And so, you know, and I use an example of, uh, let's imagine that I have a pound of hamburger on a plate and I have a, a, an ounce of gold. I set it on the floor and we bring Michael, your dog, into the room. <laughs> now, Michael absolutely has a choice as to which plate he goes to, doesn't he? Oh, he but, does, and which, you know which one he's going for. But Well, but he has a choice. We know which one he's going for, but he has a choice. But mm-hmm, we know mm-hmm. 100% of the time he and every dog in the world is going to go for the uh, pound of hamburger because they don't have the brain cells to McDonald's. recognize. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's pretty rough stuff. But anyway, they don't have the brain cells to recognize the, that with that ounce of gold, they could go out and buy 500 pounds of hamburger. If you mm-hmm. could build the brain cells into Michael's brain, your dog's brain, that this will buy you 500 pounds of hamburger, he wouldn't think about touching the pound of hamburger on the plate. And most mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. have been trained through so much hostility and rage and fear and grief and pain that to make a loving choice just isn't possible. You know, when somebody does something you don't want them to do, you just puke on them, just like dad or mom did. And, and that's how you handle it, and that's how you get ahead. That's the real world. Well, excuse me, that's not the real world. That's a total fantasy that exists between people's ears. To think that you're empowered uh, that you, just because you can puke on somebody, just because you can beat up on somebody, because you're bigger, stronger, tougher, have better weapons, and what a fraud. And and what a loss to the person who does that. But because they don't have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, they have no comprehension of what they've given up. In the same way, when Michael goes over and gulps down that pound of hamburger and walks out of them, he has no comprehension of what he's given up by walking mm-hmm. away from that out of the No comprehension mm-hmm. whatsoever. And most mm-hmm. humans, or, or pardon me, most non-humans, people functioning out of hostility and fear, have no comprehension of what they're giving up when they give up their mm-hmm. human lives, when they give up the experience and the active presence of love. And that's why we're working to restore that active presence. And, and the beauty of each worksheet that somebody does is that even if it's just for a fraction of a second, it co- collapses the non-being mind. It collapses the dissociated mind. And people get a taste. Sometimes that mind rushes back in so fast that they, they don't even know what hit them. They have no comprehension. But if they'll continue to do that work and continue to keep collapsing, collapsing, collapsing a mind based in hostility or fear, the presence of their human beingness, the presence of that love, will start to shift the mind. And all of a sudden, it will become more and more possible to choose love in circumstances that yesterday it didn't seem possible to choose love. And I promise you, if you're doing hostility or fear in a circumstance, and one day you actually truly, totally choose love in that situation, you're going to change your life. You are going to mm-hmm. change your life. And most people Absolutely. don't know what's possible, so no brain cells. And so we're here, you know, one of the purposes of our show is to help build the brain cells and uh, and get it to every mind, heart, and being on the planet so that we actually become functional human beings again. You know, and I loved what you, the word you just used was restore, that, because that is, that is the truth. It's to restore, to bring it back. Yeah, but, you know, the being that we are has never been lost. It's never disappeared. You've never stopped being loved. Uh, you know, the, the, I don't care. The worst criminal on death row never stopped being loved. However, their, their brain cell structure, their minds, their physiology – were generationally filled with rages and fears and griefs and pains that were unfathomable to the average person. And they have no comprehension of what's running them. But behind all of that, and I'll I'll share a story. When uh, when we developed this program for the prison system, my former partner's name was Dan McDougall, and uh, they called him Mr. Mack. And there was a guy in, uh, in the federal penitentiary system in Atlanta who was, um, his reputation, this man would cut somebody's throat as soon as look at them. 
while he was in prison serving a life term for I don't even know how many murders, he murdered six people. And there were some people who were losing power over others because of the forgiveness work that was being done in the prison. And they put a contract out on Mr. Mack. And this guy who was considered to be in that federal penitentiary the, the deadliest, the most vicious, the most disgusting of what people call human beings became his protector because he was awakened by Dan's actions and Dan's love. He was awakened by the presence of someone who worked with these guys who were, you know, end of the road and, and you know, down and out uh, dregs of humanity. And, and he loved, and he loved, and he loved. And this man became the one who protected him and saved his life on more than one occasion. Mm. You know, and, and I... I I can only say in so many cases people have been in prison and for for forever. And you start touching that spark in them. We did G and I did a thing in in uh, Phoenix or pardon me, Tucson, Arizona a couple of years ago where they started putting children in prison at nine. And when we started to talk to these kids about you know, we asked the question, of course we've shared this several times the last couple of weeks, but we asked the question, how many of you ever held a newborn child? And then Jeannie will ask describe the newborn and the descriptors of the newborn are always some variation on the theme of love and so here we are working with these 100 kids from six or pardon me from uh, 9 to 16 years of age and and we ask them to describe the newborn and you know here these kids are going back remembering baby brother baby sister being born and how awesome it was and and after Jeannie put that list on the board of these awesome descriptions of, of a human life and we turn to these kids who are, are in training to be the dregs, in training to be the future money makers for the prison investors. And when we said, this is you, do you realize that you've just described who you are? Do you realize that in the same way when you held your baby brother and you got an experience of how awesome he was, your baby sister, how awesome she was, do you realize Somebody did that with you, and you bought into something that's a lie about you. And, man, you want to watch kids soften and open and, you know, I don't know, maybe for a lot of them for the first time that they were seen through the eyes of love and acknowledged as love. I'll tell you what, a 100 kids' lives changed in that room that day. It's mm-hmm. just, you know, it's it's phenomenal because when you touch that spark and, you know, we created a program about 25 years ago in the Delray Unity School, kindergarten to grade 8, and the first lesson, in the, we did a thing based on our Laws of Living course that was called Lessons in Living. And uh, the first lesson that we went in from kindergarten to grade 8 with was, when I choose love, it wakes up the love in everyone. And this last trip, this trip we've done this time in Fort Lauderdale, and of course we've been up in Boca and Delray, and uh, the last time Jeannie and I were here, about three years ago, uh, several parents whose children had been in or were currently in that school came up to us and were like, we're so thankful that program is there that's made such a difference in our whole family, our whole community. And it's all based on when I choose love, it wakes up the love of everyone. And we can do that. Right. Mm-hmm. But we've got to have the brain cells to do it. We've got to have the brain cells, the support in the mind. And what the culture teaches is the rage and the fear that puts the support in the mind for a non-being life rather than functioning as humans that we're designed to function as. Well, there's a couple of things in the chat room here. Um, what, one uh, is, uh, it says, that's much like a stray cat I just took in. My dogs were barking and chasing him away until I integrated him into my house, and they saw my love and concern for the cat. Now they protect him by chasing a, another cat away that is attempting to attack him. So that, that that's that's the acts of love. That's it. Um, yep. Yeah. When I choose love, it wakes up the love in everyone. Go, go to the website. Mm-hmm. Did you find a link, Jeannie, for the uh, Christian? Go to the website and look under, what's the, uh, what's the link? Um, we, are one. we Are One. There's a link on the right-hand side titled We Are One. Click on it and watch the video on Christian the Lion. 
and here's this lion that these guys in England raised in their apartment, not to be too big. They let him loose in Alaska, or pardon me, in Africa. And a year, a year later, they go back, or six years later, I think it was. It was a year later. A year later, they went back, and they're, they're, you know, they've got this video going, and here's this huge male lion just racing down this hill toward these two guys. And I'm like, I hope this is the right lion. And uh, mm-hmm. he gets to them, jumps up on them, hugs them, loves on them, licks and kisses them. This huge lion that could have just crunched them in one bite. And... Mm-hmm. The female came with him. Now, this female was raised in the wild. Normally, okay. get that close to a female lion, you're, you're mincemeat, you're lunch. And these two guys are petting the wild female lion because mm-hmm. the male lion shows love. That mm-hmm. even in the animal realm, that attack is a learned response. It's not natural. Mm-hmm. It's and right. it's time for mm-hmm. us to change that. It's time for us to shift that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, right. there, there, there are people making a lot of money off of it. Anybody who gets concerned that if you get rid of fear and hostility in the world, you won't make as much money, that's a fraud, too. You'll make tons more, tons more. It's not going to cost you a penny to shift out of. If you're if you're doing something that's in support of some form of uh, of degradation or, or destructive behavior in the world, I promise you there's far more money by functioning as a human being and supporting human life in the world than there is to be made from all the so-called vices that uh, that produce tons of money. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, we have about three minutes left, but someone else um, wanted to know. I don't know if you have time. Says Michael, uh, tell about the energy in a football game and how much energy is expelled uh, during a cheer. I said we're, we're yeah. down to three minutes. Sure. Yeah, we can cover that pretty quickly. Do some research on uh, Schumann resonance, and Schumann resonance is a frequency that is put off by the earth, or at least I used to think it was put off by the earth. The earth is in continuous motion, and there's this measurable frequency that runs about 12 to 13 hertz. And um, there was a group up in Canada back several years ago that were studying the Schumann resonance, and it was getting weaker and weaker and weaker until they got to the point where they couldn't measure it. And then what they discovered was and this totally turned around my understanding from a physics perspective of Schumann resonance. What they found was if they were near a stadium where the home team scored, all of a sudden that frequency appeared again. I used to think, in our, if you look at the cranial structure, of the, the human structure, it's in motion at approximately the same range of frequencies as the Schumann resonance. I used to think that the planet gave off the frequency which we being part of the planet picked up and that's what drove our resonance in our our cranial structure. But once I heard that piece of information, what occurred to me or what I realized was, no, the earth is not feeding it to us. We are feeding it to the earth. We're the antenna that are bringing that frequency into the earth. And there's a place somewhere in the scriptures that talks about when we go out of harmony with love, and joy, the earth will go into trauma. And if you look at how much trauma there is in humans, and we've gone out of harmony, out of alignment with what we're supposed to be bringing into the earth, the earth is struggling to get it back. You know, if you take a a child that's a headbanger, and you realign their cranial structure, they'll stop headbanging. The child who sits and smashes their head on the wall is a child who intuitively knows that their cranium is locked up, and they need to restore its motion. And that's what they're trying to do. And so when you put your hands on that child and you get that cranial structure back in its proper alignment and its proper range of motion, all of a sudden they stop banging their heads. When we get back in alignment with who we're supposed to be, I would offer that a lot of the trauma that's going on in the earth, the earthquakes, the storms, the crazy things that are happening are going to change because we're not bringing in what we're designed to bring in. And the earth is like the head banging child going, I need to do something. You know, the NASA scientists, they established a criteria for, for life. And, and they, when the space shuttle went up, they turned the, uh, the equipment back on Earth, 
and they're and according to the standards they've established, the earth is a living being. We're part of a living being here, and we've got a part to play, and we're not playing our part. We're like a cancer cell when we're living in hostility and fear. It's time for us to go back, and we're going to see some awesome shifts on the planet as we do. Wonderful. Well, you have a wonderful cruise, Michael and Jeannie, and we will see you when you get back. Thank you. Are we getting down to the last minute already? We're down to nine seconds, six seconds. So well, have the best year one... yet of your eternal life. Best year Absolutely. Yet of your eternal life. Love we love you. Bless me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.